everybody online, welcome family. It's good to see you. And if you're in the house, just a few friends, why don't you say hi, give us a bit of shout of praise, say amen. Okay. It's not what we used to. We used to crowds, thousands of people making a record. It's not like that, but we believe God is moving across TV screens, uh, across homes. Uh, some of our friends even this morning said, we're going to be in our car heading out to uh, kind of a bit of an adventure. We'll be joining you in our car. That's pretty exciting. And so it's good to have you with us in church. And I really do believe there's breakthrough coming. I believe there's breakthrough always happening. Let me just be clear on that. But I do believe that there is uh, exponential breakthrough coming. There is something about a tension building for a breakthrough that's to come. Amen. In Jesus' name. And so whether you're in the house or online, you have permission to make noise. And in the house, it looks like clapping your hands, shouting amen, doing what you can, even though there's just a few of us. But online, it looks like putting your praise hands up in the comments tab, letting us know the scriptures or the words that are speaking to you. Or even better, being an evangelist. Yes, you can be. And sharing it with your friends. A little share uh, arrow over there. You just let you know your friends uh, are invited to church too. Amen. I'm excited about today. A quick story to get going. I was driving with my son, Joel. He's teaching me so much as children do in their early years, especially because everything is new for them and they're seeing things with fresh eyes. And I was driving with Joel and we drove past like a, a house. It seems to be a house, probably a factory that's being built with big blocks. And uh, he says to me, what's that, daddy? So I say to him, my boy, that looks like it's a factory or a house or I'm not so sure. So he said, they're building it with bricks, daddy. I said, yeah, they are. That's right, my boy. He said, so that the big bad wolf can't blow it down, daddy. To which I said, that's right, my boy. The wolf can't blow it down. And as he said that, I started thinking about church. I use anything for a little church analogy. I'll be honest. I started thinking about Ephesians chapter two. God is building a home. That's what he says. Paul says that God is building a home and he's putting us together. Listen to this, brick by brick. Brick, brick by brick. Why? So that the devil can't blow us down. I just got to say that to you. If you're in church in any form today, you're in position. Tap your neighbor and say, you're in position. If you're with your spouse at home or your kids at home or they're making a racket, find them, hold them on the shoulders and let them know you're in position. You see, the local church is the safest place, a friend once said to me, to live dangerously. I love that. We're in position. Mark Slev last year coined the phrase, we are rested people doing risky things. Oh, I feel like we sing the words, fire falls down, heaven and earth collide. We sing them like it's just another Sunday song. I'm telling you, friends, the fire is falling down. Heaven is colliding with earth. If you would just let it be in position, be in position. The title of my message today is quite simple. It's table talk and in brackets and beautiful lives. I just had to add that because I like preaching the gospel of grace which never leaves our lives feeling dull and miserable, always alive and beautiful. And I wanna preach about the gospel of grace today, going through the book of John. The series is titled Goats. Jesus is the greatest of all time as we build up to Easter. It's to remind us of this idea, is to make sure that we don't start doing church out of routine. We do it because there's relational intimacy with Jesus and who we have in Him is the greatest relationship of all time. The greatest player, if you like, of all time is on our side. His name is Jesus, goats, and the title of today's message is Table Talk. And so I wanna read it to you again, John chapter one. It's a beautiful story of how Jesus hits the scene as told by the person of John, we believe. And it's an amazing story because as I said last week, each of the gospels tells the story of Jesus in a different way. And the gospel of John likes to, us to approach Jesus as the son of God. He wants us to see him as the son of God, as deity as God among us, Emmanuel, amen? And so let's read it, John chapter one, I hope you got your Bibles out. This year we're reading our Bibles, paper, paper, here we go, John chapter one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, He was in the beginning with God. A whole lot of goodness right there. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of man, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Some translations say cannot overcome it, amen. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me. 
for he was before me and of his fullness we have received grace upon grace for the law was given through Moses I want you to remember this thought but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ no one has seen God at any time the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father he has declared him which is to suggest John is saying to us that no one has seen God until you've seen Jesus when you see Jesus you see the father and when you see the father Philip said it's more than enough you can go and read it John 4 it's really powerful so Jesus I pray one more time that you would help us to see you not ourselves we second you Jesus the beauty of your finished work the endless excess of your love for us God the the abundance of heaven showcased through the Son on earth Jesus among us Emmanuel help us to see you today Jesus help us to see you in our families to see you in our workplace to see you in our churches and our cities and the nations because to see you, Jesus, is more than enough. And we declare that as we see just a glimpse of you today, it'll be more than enough for everything we need. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. I wanna preach about table talk and I wanna set the series up again, kind of going back to where we started last week, if you like. Uh, last week, we spoke about how John was giving us an Old Testament picture in the person of Jesus. He was helping us see how in the Old Testament, man would encounter God a certain way. We're gonna look at the tabernacle in just a moment. But in the New Testament, God came to encounter man. Jesus, where man would go in to encounter God, Jesus came out to encounter us, to bring us back in. Let me just show you the picture again, and we're gonna get kind of straight into things. I'm very excited to preach today. I'm not gonna lie to you. I hope you're gonna feed on some good gospel food. This is the tabernacle. And traditionally, priests would enter in from the east side. We spoke about the east side of the brazen altar or the altar of offerings being the place of sacrifice. We also spoke about how the sun rises in the east. So when priests would enter the temple courts the following day after sacrifice was made, the first thing that they would see as the sun rose was the burnt ashes, the finished work of Jesus Christ. The first thing we see as we encounter His presence is not you and I and what we lack, it's Jesus and everything He gave. It's the finished work of Jesus as the sun rises. And so every morning as the sun rises, I don't want you to wake up and deal with what you lack. I want you to wake up and remind yourself of what you have in Him, in Jesus' name, the finished work. And so then we spoke about how the priests would move into the laver. The laver is where they would wash their hands. Many would say it's a picture of the Holy Spirit. From there, they would move into the tents of meeting. And inside the tents of meeting was what we're looking at today, which is the showbread table and the candelabra or the menorah, which was seven candlesticks. Very cool picture of light. And the, and the bread, a very cool picture of his life in ours. From there, they would move to the altar of incense. And then this thing called the veil. And from the veil, only the high priest could go into the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, where they would encounter what we would call the glory of God. Now, it's interesting. In the Old Testament, I just want to give you a picture because Jesus comes to fulfill everything they had in the Old Testament and more for free. In the Old Testament, man was obliged to go through this process to access the thing they needed most which is the presence of God. Now, we wouldn't necessarily say that in this day and age that the thing we need most is the presence of God. We might say uh, we need a breakthrough in our business. We might say we need our, our marriage to take a turn. We might say we need somebody else to do something for us to have what we need. But the truth is in our heart of hearts, we need the presence of God for in Him there is the fullness of life. In fact, that word salvation is the word soteria, which is to say fullness of life. So when we receive Jesus, we receive the fullness of life. Now in the Old Testament, priests would go through a series of traditional or religious events to access the fullness of life. One man, one man would go through all this to access what they hoped would be a blessing to the people that never had access to His presence. Now I wanna show you how in the book of John, John shows us how Jesus came from the presence of God out to people beyond the temple courts that weren't able to get in. That's you and our friends. And Jesus then turns a corner and brings us back in. He came out, as Pastor Joseph Prince said, to bring us in. 
Now watch this. In John chapter 1, you can go and read the, 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 the story of John. I really want you to read your Bible. I want you to get into it yourself and, and trust that not everything I have to say is what God has to say to you, all right? He's going to speak to you in your own unique way. But in John chapter 1, we see this beautiful picture of the Word becoming flesh. If we can look at this kind of graphic that they've put together for us, on the left we have the Ark of the Covenant, all right? And it's the presence of God on earth. It's the picture of heaven on earth. And it says the Word became flesh, which is to suggest that that which was captured in the presence of God in heaven became flesh. The veil, as we looked at last week, was the flesh or is the flesh. Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the veil torn for us. He is the flesh torn for us. And so the Word in the presence of God became flesh and dwelt among us. He became our bread and light. And as you journey through the book of John, John 6 speaks about the bread of Jesus. I'm gonna speak about that today. John 8 talks about the light of the world. As Jesus journeys through this process, we get the picture of in the Old Testament, man would need to go in to find God, but in the New Testament, God would come out to find man. Jesus is reversing the cycle of events to find us and then fulfill the cycle of events to bring us back in. Now, you're sitting there going, this is confusing. Just let the part that blesses you the most find you. You don't need to hear all of what God is doing to get your fill is what I'm trying to say. Jesus will give you what you need today for your marriage, for your family, for your business, for your children, for your world. But Jesus is showing us in the book of John how He comes out. It's amazing. In John chapter 12, it actually says, you know the famous scripture, Jesus said, if, if, if I will be lifted up, then I will draw all men unto me. Let's go back to this picture. Jesus is coming out and in John 12, there's a turning point. It's a picture of the altar of sacrifice where he says, if I will be lifted up, he's, he's kind of predicting his death and resurrection, I will draw all men. Actually, the NKJV says peoples. In fact, the original doesn't even have the word. In your Bible, if you have the NKJV, you'll notice the word peoples is in italics. That's because it wasn't there. It's been added. So what it actually says when Jesus speaks about the cross that was gonna produce something for you and I, is he says, when I'm lifted up, he's in the context of the cross, I will draw all, not peoples, all unto me. What's he speaking about? All your sin, all your pain, all your lack, all the condemnation, all the shame. I will draw, remember that song in, um, remember we used to sing that song? Lift Jesus higher, remember that number? Lift Jesus higher. Lift him up for the world to see. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men. That's not what it's about. It's a cool song, but he's not just drawing all men. He's drawing disease and he's drawing lack and he's drawing shame and he's drawing condemnation. When the name of Jesus is lifted up, friends, it's not just about us getting access to Him. It's about Him removing everything that restricts our access in the first place. That's why I'm excited to preach the gospel. I know we come to church because we wanna get to God, but I wanna tell you, friends, God came to us. He started the story. Church came after, He came to us, am I right? And so the whole story of the book of John is God coming to us to find us where we're at. And I was thinking about this moment in time, how if we're really honest, some of us are, are pretty fatigued. And uh, we're wondering, I don't know what I need to do to get back into the presence of God or to find myself in Him. Well, good news for you, sir and ma'am, is that you don't need to do anything. He came to you. The book of John reminds us, you don't come to Him. He comes to you and He brings you back to you. And we ongoingly try and prove ourselves to God. Let me say it like this. In the Old Testament, man strives to get access to the presence of God. In the New Testament, man surrenders to the already given presence of God. The traits of grace are surrender and joy. The traits of law are striving and fatigue. And there are more, but as I preach, as we build up to Easter, and I'm excited for Easter Sunday, we might have a special guest, maybe, 99% sure, can't say just yet, but I know you're gonna enjoy them. But I wanna tell you, Easter message is the message of grace and that God comes out to us. 
And then watch what happens. And John, can we put that graphic back up? In John chapter 12, Jesus predicts his death on the cross. It's a picture of the brazen altar. In John chapter 12, in John chapter 13, let's pull the scripture up. It's such a beautiful thing. I'm gonna read it to you. Watch this. In John chapter 13, Jesus turns the corner. He makes clear his intent on earth, which is that he came out to bring us in. Watch this. Jesus knowing, John chapter 13, verse three, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper, oh, He's turned a corner. He's going back and He's bringing us in. Notice how the showbread and the wine, and we'll speak about that in a moment, they're the supper. He comes out and there's the cross and He encounters people and He says, I've come from God, I'm going back to God. And they rose from the supper. He's going back in. You with me, church? Watch what He does first. He rose from the supper and laid aside His garments and He took a towel and girded Himself. And after that, He poured water into a basin he poured water Jesus comes out from the presence of God Jesus is not a cool attachment to our lives he's the presence of God on earth he came from heaven to find us on earth he's still coming from heaven to find us from earth and he's drawing us into his presence but watch this he predicts his death he takes the bowl and he puts water in it and he begins to wash their feet he's returning back into the presence If you can see this, if you can see this, you can see life. If you can see that God is still sending His presence into our lives to find us, remind us of the finished work of the cross, and then draw us back in, how? By the washing of the Word, by the washing of our feet. By the way, when the Word is preached, we should feel washed, not of our sin, that's taken care of by the blood. Can I just preach for a moment? The blood is taking care of your sin once for all and forever. The washing should make you feel alive. It should make you feel fresh. It make you feel free. When the Word is preached, it doesn't make you feel like your sin's forgiven. It's been done. I feel like I'm preaching, next generation. And Jesus is drawing us into His presence. All right, let's talk about the showbread. This is awesome. I got the team to, so in the tents of meeting is the showbread. Now remember when Jesus is coming out, it's a picture of His presence on earth, all right? His body and His blood coming out for us. And then when he goes back in, it's a picture of him fulfilling that so we can have full access to God. But that's interesting. I wanna teach you a few things about the showbread. Uh, I won't be long and then you can go and feed in it for yourself. But there were 12 bread, 12 loaves of bread on the showbread table. And uh, these represented, many would say, the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, and so Jesus was interested in every tribe and tongue and people. And so that's what it was kind of showcasing. Many would call this the bread of his presence. Uh, some would call it the bread of his face which is to suggest when the priests interacted with the showbread, they were interacting with the personal presence of God, which is to suggest when we interact with what, is come to, what we've come to know as the miracle meal, we're not just religiously following routine, hoping that God would show up for us, we're encountering Him, all right? Let's talk about the first point I have for you today. Write this down, the family table. There's nothing quite like an invitation to a good meal, amen? I remember the first time I got invited for a lunch with Pastor Brian Houston. I, I had followed him, I'd read his books, I loved their church. And I remember the first time I got invited to go and join him for a lunch. I was kind of like, I was excited. Maybe you've had this with a friend or someone for the first time or a family. I was excited, but I was kind of like nervous. I had this like nervous energy about me. I was, I, I was going to be in the presence of this giant in leadership and faith. And I remember thinking, I can't wait for this, but I'm not sure I'm ready for this. You know, and, and I so badly wanted it. And then I sat down and, and his presence was calming and it was confident and it was at ease. And I remember thinking, this is such an incredible privilege. There's nothing quite like being invited for a meal. In fact, let me in this moment ask you, if you could sit down to lunch with anybody, who would it be? Like we often, uh, we often talk about this. If I could have a moment with anybody, let's ramp it up. Not a moment, a meal. If you could be seated at their family table for a moment, who would it be? If you could be in their presence for a moment, who would it be? 
Hey, here's the cool thing about the gospel of Jesus is he brings the family table to us. That's why Jesus said to Zacchaeus, come down from the tree, Zacchaeus. You coming to, no, I'm coming to your house for tea. The gospel continues to come to our house every time we hold communion. That's why Jesus said, as often as you eat and drink it, because this was never meant to be a weekly ritual. This was meant to be daily relationship. He comes to our house. The moment we break this bread and drink this blood, it's a representation of Him coming to our house, the family table. If Brian Houston could get me that excited about a moment with Him, how much more so Jesus, friends? Can I get an amen? How much more so Jesus? Imagine eating with Jesus. Well, you get to do it every day. Like I don't want to be a church that goes, oh, one day when? No, we have His presence with us now. John shows us that the bread of life became our lives. Let's read John chapter six. Listen to this, it's beautiful. John chapter six, Jesus talks about being the bread of life. Such an amazing part of scripture. It says, our fathers, this is them saying to Jesus, are the manna in the desert as gave us manna in the desert, as it is, is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses didn't give you the bread, but my Father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to us. Moses didn't give you bread. Moses was the law. That was striving. Jesus is grace. He's the true bread. In Him we surrender. Maybe you just need to surrender again today to the goodness of God. Welcome Him into every part of your life. And Jesus said, verse 35, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. Question, are you spiritually hungry? Answer, you need Jesus. Like, it's simple. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. I love the family table. I love that it comes to us. If you're at home right now, I'd love you to get communion ready. We're gonna share it before the day is over. Second thing I wanna say about the showbread, it's just getting better, T-Wiz. Like, I feel like I'm warming up and I'm having fun because I'm at my father's table. I'm not sure if the church feels the same way. They're welcome to take whatever they want, but um, I'm gonna take the presence of God today because I need it just like you. I'm not gonna miss a moment to remind myself that Jesus came to me to bring me back to God. Maybe you're feeling fatigued and tired and worn out. And God, I need you. Well, this is a reminder that He comes to feed you. 12 breaths, 12 tribes, all people. It's a family table. <laughs> the second thing about this bread, I would, I'm gonna touch it, is I know you're dreaming about bunny chows. That's, that's, you know it's the truth. And I just took away one option because you can't, it's COVID. This is my bunny chow, the whole loaf, all of it. Um, but it says that the, this bread's really fresh, actually, team, well done. Um, it says that the loaves were replaced weekly. And uh, I was praying about that. And I wondered why the priests would replace the loaves weekly. I thought about Sundays. There's a picture of church on Sundays that there's fresh men in the house. There's fresh revelation for his people to feed on. I believe that. But I felt God say to me, you should write this down. He said, don't rush the revelation. I said, God, you're gonna have to teach me more about that. He said, don't rush the revelation. I said, keep going. He said, don't rush the revelation. Which is to say that bread is Jesus that fills us. So when we see Jesus, we get our fill, not from earthly satisfaction, from heaven's storehouse. And when we get our fill, we have everything we need to live out a purpose-filled, peaceful, calm, confident, joyful life. In Jesus' name, amen. That's what we get in Jesus. But what often happens is when we open the Word, amen, that became flesh. Do you remember the graphic? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We open the Word, we read a scripture, we move on. Next day, new scripture, new Word. Next day, new scripture, new Word. Next day, new topic. Today, I'm struggling with fear. 
Google, fear scriptures, eat scriptures. I'm not saying it's wrong. I think it's awesome. Google's helped us in some ways, but I think there's something to be said for not rushing the revelation, which is to say, Jesus, I'm coming to your storehouse. I'm opening your word. I'm taking a moment and I'm gonna let you speak. And if you speak to me about being patient in my business, I'm not gonna rush the revelation. I'm gonna feed on that on Monday and then Tuesday and then Wednesday and then Thursday. I might not even read another scripture for the rest of the week. Is that okay, Dill? Is it all right that I didn't get through my Devo? I wanted to get seven in, Dill. I'm only gonna get one in because you're suggesting friends. Don't rush the revelation. Rest with Him. Sit with Him. Learn from Him. Grow in Him. Somebody say, hey, man, I feel like I'm preaching better than you hearing it. I really do. I just feel like. Don't rush the revelation. Some of us are opening our Bible every day looking for a new word. Maybe there's one that he spoke in Jan. He's still trying to let you feed on. Like, maybe it's time to hear what he's really trying to say, not what you're wanting to hear. (laughs) I call this the, the secret of meditation. God said to Joshua, meditate on this word day and night so that you'll be successful in all you do. That word meditate is murmur which is to suggest if I read words like I am the bread of life, then I murmur those words. I meditate on those words day and night that I might be successful in all I do. And so what does murmuring sound like? I say, Jesus, you're the bread of life. That's interesting, Jesus. Show me how you're the bread of life in my business, Jesus, because I I wanna see you as the bread of life in all that I do, Jesus. I know you're the bread of life. Show me in my family, Jesus. I'm just murmuring. I'm playing the conversation through in my spirit and in my mind and in my heart. I'm allowing it to sink into my body. I want it to become part of my life. I want the bread to sustain me. I don't just want it to be a source, a momentary source of inspiration. I want it to be a sustained life with God. And so you get the word in your quiet time in the morning and the word is, trust me for your provision and you walk into a conversation around business and it's not going according to plan and you start going, God, I need you. Murmur it. I'm trusting you for my provision, God. You promised me that you're my provision, God. Therefore, I don't need an outcome from this meeting. I have the outcome in heaven. It's already been signed off. I don't need to sign it off. It's already been signed off. The master, the grand master chess player, as my friend Rory Dyer said, he signed off the outcome for me. And so the timing might not be what I want, but I can be sure the inheritance is secure because the inheritance is guaranteed by him. Timing by man, inheritance by God. Timing by man, inheritance by God. I'm frustrated by the timing by man. I'm sure you are, so am I. But inheritance is found in him meditate on a day and night he said to Joshua Joshua was going to walk in to get this an inheritance houses that were built by others plants uh, crops that were planted by others a future that was secured by others he did nothing to do anything for himself but God said meditate on my word He's so caught up in the timing of this world. Meditate on my word. I feel like I'm preaching I might even start singing because God is starting to move in our hearts I love that the priest would walk past the showbread and stop and pause and eat and wait and enjoy his presence. Don't rush the revelation. Some of you are gonna close your notebooks and Bibles and rush out of church today, desperate to get to your next appointment. Can I give you a little tip? Cancel it. Cancel it. Take a seat at the family table. You need to break bread as a family. Maybe you need to get your kids around the table. Maybe husbands and wives need to sit at the table. Maybe you need to ask a friend to come break bread with you. But there is revelation God wants to give you that secures the future that God prepared for you. Don't rush the revelation. It's like a holy moment. I love it how Paul prayed that I may know him. Not that I may know what he wants. That comes next, that I may know him. You know, when you're getting to know somebody, when I was getting to know Tess, when I found out her love for books, I didn't go, oh, she loves books. All right, let's find out the next thing I love about her. 
no, I sat and we, and we talked about it and we started to discover the love and the passion for books and for words and we, we hung in there. Do you see what I'm saying? When you get to know God and suddenly you realize that He wants good things for your life, don't rush off and go, okay, tick. Now I know that He wants good things. Let me see what else He's up to. Sit, murmur, converse. Don't rush the revelation. Hang in there. Every week they change the bread. And the last thing I want to say is we talk about the showbread. All I'm trying to do is show you that Jesus gives us all this basically to give us access to all of Him. Everything that we see is to remind us of Him, not ourselves. All right, the last thing I want to speak about is a furnished life. A furnished life. Or in my words, a beautiful life. A beautiful life. Valence life. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's so much better than Valence. Honestly, Valence, you did great. I think it's Chris. You're awesome. Shout out to you and your crew. But this is just so much better than that. I'm talking about something far more supernatural. All right. But anyway, let's keep moving. I'm going to go off track just now. They're going to start judging me on the line. So here we go. When you walk into the table of presence, what we see is a table that is made from acacia wood, which we believe is what carved out the cross. And it's covered in gold. All right, I want you to watch this church. Ask your kids, I don't know if you're at home, ask them just five minutes, five minutes. Take a breather, five minutes. I need to hear what's about to be said here, right? Lean in. Acacia wood covered in gold. A finished work furnished with heaven. That's at the table of bread. That's good, I know. A finished work furnished with heaven gold. We're told that heaven's gonna be laid with streets of gold. It's furnished in gold. A finished work furnished with heaven. That's what's in the bread. I'm the true bread. I'm the life. So every time you feed on me, you'll never be hungry. Never go thirsty again. What is he saying? There is a finished work and a furnished life. And God sent me to tell you today, Link Church, and whoever's listening to this message, that when you come to Jesus as the bread of life, when you see Him fulfilling the table of the showbread and turning the corner at the cross and bringing us back into the Lord's Supper, when He breaks His bread with His boys, He says to them, I am. He says, this is my body, this is my blood. When He's doing that, He's saying, it is a finished work that is gonna give you a furnished life. He's prophesying something that we could never produce in our own strength. And I feel like He wants to go us furnished lives. 2 Timothy chapter 3. So our mission statement as a church speaks about the Word being useful for correction and completion and instruction and godly living and righteousness. And he says, verse 2 Timothy 3, it says that you may be made complete for every good work. What completes us? The Word completes us. The Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the one and only Father who came from Him full of grace and truth, that we might become the presence of God. The Word became flesh. Oh, I'm just gonna get myself a little bit of His flesh here because if this is the truth, friends, when this gets a hold of my heart, and I start to feed on His finished work, I start to have a furnished life, Jesus. I'm cheating now. I feel like I'm living in an unfair advantage. I feel like I'm accessing what everybody really wants. And you just give it to us for free. Your word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And the showbread reminds us that this is his dwelling on earth. Every time you come to the family table, every time you break bread, you are accessing not just a finished work, but a furnished life, a life furnished with joy and provision and healing and wholeness and freedom and forgiveness. It's a finished work, yes, that gives us access, but it's a furnished life which gives us authority to walk in favor and to walk with a confidence and to walk with a calm in Jesus' mighty name, a furnished life. Can I get an amen? All right, stand with me if, if you're in this room or if you're at home. I wonder how that theology will preach. I'm cheating took some bread and I ate it. I said, I feel like I'm cheating. I don't know that that's a theology, but it does feel unfair to receive what I don't deserve. Watch this, the book of John. Jesus, when he's dying on the cross, is not like the other books. In the other books, Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them, let this pass. It's very wordy, it's very human. In the book of John, you know what he says? Three words, 
it is finished. Jesus comes out from the presence of God to bring a broken, undeserving, frustrated, tired, fatigued, COVID community back in to the presence of the Father. And His words are, it is finished. So Jesus, I declare of every heart, every home, everywhere, every handset that's listening in right now, and it is finished gospel. I thank you, Jesus, that you never came out and left us in no man's land, that you finished the work and that you furnished our lives. Jesus, we declare that our lives are furnished in you. We're not just, we're not just have access to the kingdom of heaven, God. We have authority to walk in freedom and favor with everything you've called us to here on earth, God. So I pray right now for peace in people's hearts and minds. I thank you, Jesus, for your power, your dunamis, your Holy Spirit to come in now and reaffirm what is already being claimed, a finished work and a furnished life, a finished work and a furnished life. You have everything you need to access all that you, God has for your life, friends, everything you need. Your life is royal, your life is beautiful, your life is holy, your life is set apart, your life is not poor, your life is not broken, your life is not average, your life is meaningful, and your life is pure, and your life is precious because we have a finished work and we have a furnished life in Jesus' mighty name.